Hello, my chicklets. Thank you for stopping by. I hope you all are thinking about those that you care about, making sure to let them know that they are loved. Normally, I would try and have some kind of Valentine's story for you. However, I couldn't find one that I liked. So today, we're just going to go ahead and read the story of Wally Dad, the Simple Hearted. This is part of the Brown Fairy Book, collected by Andrew Lang. And as always, a link to the actual story can be found in the description, as well as my many other links. I do hope you enjoy. Let's jump into the story of Wally Dad, the Simple Hearted. Once upon a time, there lived a poor old man whose name was Wally Dad Gunjay, or Wally Dad the Bald. He had no relations, but lived all by himself in a little mud hut some distance from any town. And he made his living by cutting grass in the jungle and selling it as fodder for horses. He only earned by this five halfpence a day, but he was a simple old man and needed so little out of it that he saved up one halfpence daily and spent the rest upon such food and clothing as he required. In this way, he lived for many years until one night he thought that he would count the money he had hidden away in the great earthen pot under the floor of his hut. So he set to work, and with much trouble, he pulled the bag out onto the floor, and sat gazing in astonishment at the heap of coins which tumbled out of it. What should he do with them all, he wondered, but he never thought of spending the money on himself, because he was so content to pass the rest of his days as he had been doing, for ever so long, and he really had no desire for any greater comfort or luxury. At last, he threw all the money into an old sack, which he pushed under his bed, and then rolled into his ragged old blanket. He went off to sleep. Early next morning, he staggered off with his sack of money to the shop of a jeweler, whom he knew in the town, and bargained with him for a beautiful little gold bracelet. With this carefully wrapped up in his cotton waistband, he went to the house of a rich friend who was a traveling merchant, and used to wander about with his camels and merchandise through many countries. Wally Dad was lucky enough to find him at home, so he sat down and after a little talk he asked the merchant who was the most virtuous and beautiful lady he had ever met with. The merchant replied that the Princess of Kanistan was renowned everywhere as well for the beauty of her person as for the kindness and generosity of her disposition. Then, said Wally Dad, next time you go that way, give her this little bracelet with the respectful compliments of one who admires virtue far more than he desires wealth. With that, he pulled the bracelet from his waistband and handed it to his friend. The merchant was naturally much astonished, but said nothing and made no objection to carrying out his friend's plan. Time passed by, and at length the merchant arrived in the course of his travels at the capital of Kanistan. As soon as he had opportunity, he presented himself at the palace and sent in the bracelet neatly packed in a little perfumed box provided by himself, giving at the same time the message entrusted to him by Wally Dad. The princess could not think who could have bestowed this present on her, but she bade her servant to tell the merchant that if he would return, after he had finished his business in the city, she would give him her reply. In a few days, therefore, the merchant came back and received from the princess a return present in the shape of of a camel load or rich silks, beside a present of money for himself. With these, he set out on his journey. Some months later, he got home again from his journeyings and proceeded to take Wally Dad the princess's present. Great was the perplexity of the good man to find a camel load of silks tumbled at his door. What was he to do with these costly things? But presently, after much thought, he begged the merchant to consider whether he did not know of some young prince to whom such treasures might be useful. "'Of course,' cried the merchant, greatly amused. "'From Delhi to Baghdad, from Constantinople to Lucknow, I know them all, and there lives none worthier than the gallant and wealthy young prince of Nagad. "'Very well, then. Take the silks to him, with the blessing of an old man,' said Wally Dad, much relieved to be rid of them." So the next time that the merchant journeyed that way, he carried the silks with him, and in due course arrived at Nakad, and sought an audience of the prince. When he was shown into his presence, he produced the beautiful gift of silks that Wally Dad had sent, and begged the young man to accept them as a humble tribute to his worth and greatness. 
The prince was much touched by the generosity of the giver, and ordered as a return present twelve of the finest breed of horses, for which his country was famous to be delivered over to the merchant, to whom also, before he took his leave, he gave a munificent reward of his services. As before, the merchant at last arrived at home, and next day he set out for Wally Dad's house with the twelve horses. When the old man saw them coming in the distance, he said to himself, "'Here's luck, a troop of horses coming. They're sure to want quantities of grass, and I shall sell all I have without having to drag it to market.' Thereupon he rushed off and cut grass as fast as he could. When he got back, with as much grass as he could possibly carry, he was greatly discomfited to find that the horses were all for himself. At first, he could not think what to do with them, but after a little, a brilliant idea struck him. He gave two to the merchant and begged him to take the rest to the princess of Kanistan, who clearly the fittest person to possess such beautiful animals. The merchant departed laughing, but true to his old friend's request, he took the horses with him on his next journey and eventually presented them safely to the princess. This time the princess sent for the merchant and questioned him about the giver. Now the merchant was usually a most honest man, but he did not quite like to describe Wally Dad in his true light as an old man whose income was five halfpence a day, and who had hardly clothes to cover him. So he told her that his friend had heard stories of her beauty and goodness, and had longed to lay the best he had at her feet. The princess then took her father into her confidence, and begged him to advise her what courtesy she might return to one who persisted in making her such presents. Well, the king said, you cannot refuse them, so the best thing you can do is to send this unknown friend at once a present so magnificent that he is not likely to be able to send you anything better, and so will be ashamed to send anything at all. Then he ordered that, in place of each of the ten horses, two mules laden with silver should be returned to her. Thus, in a few hours, the merchant found himself in charge of a splendid caravan, and he had to hire a number of armed men to defend it on the road against the robbers, and he was glad indeed to find himself back again in Wally Dad's hut. Well now, cried Wally Dad, as he reviewed all the wealth laid at his door, I can well reply that kind prince for his magnificent present of horses, but to be sure you have been put to great expense. Still, if you will accept six mules and their loads, and will take the rest straight to Nakad, I shall thank you heartily. The merchant felt handsomely repaid for his troubles, and wondered greatly how the matter would turn out, so he made no difficulty about it, and as soon as he could get things ready, he set off for Nakad, with this new and princely gift. This time the prince too was embarrassed, and questioned the merchant closely. The merchant felt that his credit was at stake, and whilst inwardly determining that he would not carry the joke any further, could not help describing Wally Dad in such glowing terms that the old man would never have known himself had he heard them. The prince, like the king of Kaistan, determined that he would send in return a gift that would be truly royal, and which would perhaps prevent the unknown giver sending him anything more. So he made up a caravan on twenty splendid horses, caparisoned in gold, embroidered cloths, with fine Morocco saddles, and silver bridles, and stirrups, also twenty camels of the best breed, which had the speed of racing horses and could swing along at a trot all day without getting tired. And lastly, twenty elephants, with magnificent silver hudads and coverings of silk embroidered with pearls. To take care of these animals, the merchant hired a little army of men, and the troop made a great show as they traveled along. When Wally Dad from a distance saw the cloud of dust which the caravan made, and the glitter of its appointments, he said to himself, By Allah, here's a grand crowd coming. Elephants too. Grass will be selling well today. And with that he hurried off to the jungle and cut grass as fast as he could. As soon as he got back, he found the caravan had stopped at his door, and the merchant was waiting, a little anxiously, to tell him the news and to congratulate him upon his riches. Riches? cried Wally Dad. What has an old man like me with one foot in the grave to do with riches? That beautiful young princess now, 
she'd be the one to enjoy all these fine things. Do take for yourself two horses, two camels, and two elephants, with all their trappings, and present the rest to her. The merchant at first objected to these remarks, pointed out to Wally Dad that he was beginning to feel these embassies a little awkward. Of course, he was himself richly repaid, so far as expense went, but still he did not like going so often, and he was getting nervous. At length, however, he consented to go once more, but he promised himself never to embark on another such enterprise. So after a few days' rest, the caravan started off once more for Kaistan. The moment the king of Kaistan saw the gorgeous train of men and beasts entertaining his palace courtyard, he was so amazed that he hurried down in person to inquire about it, and became dumb when he heard that these also were a present from the princely Walidad, and were for the princess, his daughter. He went hastily off to her apartments, and said to her, I tell you what it is, my dear, this man wants to marry you. That is the meaning of all these presents. There is nothing for it, but that we go and pay him a visit in person. He must be a man of immense wealth, and as he's so devoted to you, perhaps you might do worse than to marry him. The princess agreed with all that her father said, and the orders were issued for vast numbers of elephants and camels and gorgeous tents and flags and littens for the ladies and horses for the men to be prepared without delay as the king and princess were going to pay a visit to the great and munificent Prince Walidad. Merchant, the king declared, was to guide the party. The feeling of the poor merchant in this sore dilemma can hardly be imagined. Willingly would he have run away, but he was treated with so much hospitality as Wally Dad's representative that he hardly got an instant's real peace and never any opportunity of slipping away. In fact, after a few days, despair possessed him to such a degree that he made up his mind that all that happened was fate and that escape was impossible. But he hoped devoutly some turn of fortune would reveal to him a way out of the difficulties which he had with the best intentions drawn upon himself. On the seventh day, they all started, amidst thunderous salutes from the ramparts of the city, and much dust and cheering and blaring of trumpets. Day after day, they moved on, and every day the poor merchant felt more ill and miserable. He wondered what kind of death the king would invent for him, and went through almost as much torture as he lay awake nearly the whole of every night, thinking over the situation, as he would have suffered if the king's executioners were already setting to work upon his neck. At last, they were only one day's march from Molly Dad's little mud home. Here, a great encampment was made, and the merchant was sent on to tell Wally Dad that the king and princess of Kaistan had arrived and were seeking an interview. When the merchant arrived, he found the poor old man eating his evening meal of onions and dried bread. When he told him of all that had happened, he had not the heart to proceed to load him with the reproaches which rose to his tongue, for Wally Dad was overwhelmed with grief and shame for himself, for his friend, and for the name and honor of the princess, and he wept and plucked at his beard and groaned most piteously. With tears, he begged the merchant to detain them for one day by any kind of excuse he could think of, and to come in the morning to discuss what they should do. As soon as the merchant was gone, Wally Dad made up his mind that there was only one honorable way out of the shame and distress that he had created by his foolishness, and that was to kill himself. So without stopping to ask anyone's advice, he went off in the middle of the night to a place where the river wound at the base of steep rocky cliffs of great height, and determined to throw himself down and put an end to his life. When he got to the place, he drew back a few paces, took a little run, and at the very edge of that dreadful black gulf, he stopped short. He could not do it. From below, unseen in the blackness of the deep night shadows, the water roared and boiled around the jagged rocks. He could picture the place as he knew it, only ten times more pitless and foreboding in the visionless darkness. The wind soughed through the gorge with fearsome sighs and rustling and whispering, and the bushes and grasses that grew in the ledges of the cliff seemed to him like living creatures that danced and beckoned, shadowy and indistinct. An owl laughed, whoo, whoo, 
almost in his face, as he peered over the edge of the gulf, and the old man threw himself back in a perspiration of horror. He was afraid. He drew back shuddering, and covering his face in his hands, he wept aloud. Presently, he was aware of a gentle radiance that shed itself before him. Surely morning was not already coming to hasten and reveal his disgrace. He took his hands from before his face and saw before him two lovely beings whom his instinct told him were not mortal, but were Paris from paradise. "'Why do you weep, old man?' said one in a voice as clear and musical as that of the bulbul. "'I weep for shame.' replied he. "'What do you have here?' questioned the other. "'I came here to die,' said Wally Dad. As they questioned him, he confessed all his story. Then the first stepped forward and laid a hand upon his shoulder, and Wally Dad began to feel something strange, what he did not know, was happening to him. His old cotton rags of clothes were changed to beautiful linen and embroidered cloth. On his hard, bare feet were warm, soft shoes, and on his head a great jeweled turban. Round his neck there lay a heavy golden chain, and the little old bent sickle, which he cut grass with, and which hung in his waistband, had turned into a gorgeous scimitar, whose ivory hilt gleamed in the pale light like snow in the moonlight. As he stood wondering, like a man in a dream, the other Perry waved her hand and bade him turn and see. And lo, before him, a noble gateway stood open, and up an avenue a giant palace on the very spot where his hut had stood. A gorgeous palace appeared, ablaze with myriads of lights. Its great porticos and verandas were occupied by hurrying servants, and guards paced to and fro and saluted him respectfully as he drew near. Along mossy walks and through sweeping grassy lawns where fountains were playing and flowers scented the air. Wally Dad stood stunned and helpless. Fear not, said one of the Paris. Go to your house and learn that God rewards the simple-hearted. With those words, they both disappeared and left him. He walked on, thinking still that he must be dreaming. Very soon he retired to rest in a splendid room, far grander than anything he had ever dreamed of. When morning dawned, he woke, and found that the palace and himself and his servants were all real, and that he was not dreaming after all. If he was dumbfounded, the merchant, who was ushered into his presence soon after sunrise, was much more so. He told Wally Dad that he had not slept all night, and by the first streak of daylight he had started to seek out his friend, and what a search he had had, a great stretch of jungle country had, in the night, been changed into parks and gardens, and if it had not been for some of Wally Dad's new servants who found him and brought him to the palace, he would have fled away under the impression that his troubles had sent him crazy, and that all he saw was only imagination. Then Wally Dad told the merchant all that had happened— by his advice, he sent an invitation to the king and the princess of Kahistan to come and be his guests, together with all their retinue and servants, down to the very humblest in the camp. For three nights and days a great feast was held in honor of the royal guests. Every evening the king and his nobles were served on golden plates and from golden cups, and the smaller people on silver plates and from silver cups and each evening each guest was requested to keep the plates and cups that they had used as a remembrance of the occasion. Never had anything so splendid been seen. Besides the great dinners, there were sports and hunting and dances and amusements of all sorts. On the fourth day, the king of Kahistan took his host aside and asked him whether it was true, as he had suspected, that he wished to marry his daughter. But Wally Dad, after thanking him very much for the compliment, said that he had never dreamed of so great an honor, and that he was far too old and ugly for so fair a lady. But he begged the king to stay with him until he could send for the prince of an Akkad, who was a most excellent, brave, and honorable young man, and would surely be delighted to try to win the hand of the beautiful princess. To this the king agreed, 
and Walidad sent the merchant to Nakad with a number of attendants, and with such handsome presents that the prince came at once, fell head over ears in love with the princess, and married her at Walidad's palace amidst a fresh outburst of rejoicings. And now the king of Kaistan and the prince and princess of Nakad each went back to their own country, and Walidad lived to a good old age, befriending all who were in trouble and preserving, in his prosperity, the simple-hearted and generous nature that he had when he was only Walidad Gunje, the grass cutter. Thank you all for listening. I really liked this story. I don't always read these stories before I start recording them, so it was kind of a joy to see that we got some Eastern elements instead of the typical Western, Germany, Britain elements that I see in a lot of these stories. Thank you so much for listening. I do hope y'all enjoyed it, and I hope you have a wonderful day.